open the meeting at 6.32. Um, was the October 3rd meeting of the monthly Roxbury Board of School Directors. Uh, first order of business is public comment. I won't go through my little public comment spiel because there is no one from the public on either the screen or the room. Um, so next order of business is the consent agenda. I believe we're supposed to add curriculum appointments. Co-curriculars. Co yeah. um, so I have a motion to approve the consent agenda with the addition of the co-curriculars. I move the approval of the consent agenda with the addition of the co-curricular appointment. Do I have a second? Thanks. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Jake, you and I too, I'm assuming so. Yeah, we're you're, you're muted or yeah. how we can't hear you. You can give a thumbs up and we'll count it, but it sounds like we should fix your fix your phone problem. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I just muted. Oh, that's that's working. All right, okay, cool. Um So this is board business. I do want to just take a couple of minutes. We've had some, it's not an issue now, but we've had some people comment that we are difficult to hear where the seats are seated. And I'm wondering if there's, one thing I thought of is, is can we just move everything up for next time? Just so people are uh -huh. kind of- They don't have to be so far back. Yeah. And we could even move the table up. I mean, there's a little, feels a little, Inquisitorial. Yeah. Um, Thank you, Red. If people attend in person, they can't attend. Yeah. yeah. So, and it's also really hard to, for them to hear anyone who's talking to us because yeah. they're not facing gotcha. them. Yeah. So, if we brought the chairs up, we could probably like spread them out so the, because rows are pretty tight. So, just make them like longer horizontally, move the table. Can we try it? Move the table up and, um, might make us feel a little less distant too mm -hmm. uh, i don't know just thought livy for maybe next time with setup um because we definitely don't want to be inaccessible to people who spend their evening here yeah uh um, exactly i don't think with the microphones so um so part of this uh cvcc update uh jill and again thank you for all you do for a CVCC? Mm -hmm. A screen? I can't multitask very well, so forgive me. We, um, we can give you a, a moment or two. You want one of us to share? Yeah. I got it. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Let's see what comes up. All right, I'll zoom in. Um, yeah, thank you. I. Um, I just thought it'd be helpful. We've got a lot of new board members and the, um, sorry, it's asking if I want to admit Delcor, maybe someone else is in the Zoom. You don't need um, to worry about that, Jill. I got you covered. Okay. <clears throat> um, so yeah, so uh, I just thought it'd be helpful to update the board and the public about um, our role with the Central Vermont Career Center. Um, we, uh, this past, this current school year is sort of our first full year as a new district. So just for a little context, I am the Montpelier Roxbury School Board member representative on what is now the Central Vermont Career Center District. There are three of these in the state. A lot more um, career centers exist in Vermont, but they're part of a specific school district. So um, a few years ago, there was a governance committee that I was a part of. Um, again, as the Montpelier Roxbury representative to explore the idea of becoming an independent technical center district. Um, that was successful. Um, it was officially um, formed the past year. Um, so each of the boards from the 18 towns um, that participate in the Career Center have um, board representation. So I'm your representative on the board. And then there's also at-large members. So the member from Montpelier Roxbury is Lyman Castle. Um, so it operates just like a school district in the sense that there is a board um, that makes decisions. We have facility committee meetings, finance committee meetings. Um, we meet uh, once a month 
Um, and right now the Central Vermont Career Center is located in the Spalding High School campus. Um, and I think that was a big part of why it was really important to explore an independent district. It serves a lot of students, like I said, from the 18 towns um, of Central Vermont. And um, there definitely are some changing needs for what the sort of programs of study are that the Career Center offers. Um, and it also gives each of the sending districts a lot more direct say in the programs that are offered, the budget that's developed, um, and the sort of direction of the program. So um, that I just thought it'd be helpful to update the community on that piece that you are also members of the Center of Vermont Career Center. Um, Montpelier does send um, several students to the Career Center. Um, it's currently a half day program. So those students actually get bused from their sending schools. They participate in those Career Center programs, but they still um, graduate from and take their core courses at their sending high school. Um, we recently got mailed um, the course of study. So it's a it's I sort of one of the reasons I thought it'd be neat to share this with you all. Um, the website for the Career Center is really has a ton of really good information on it. Um, and it includes sort of a, a description of the course of study and how many students at each of the sending districts go there. I'll stop my share for a sec because I'm just making a mess of it. Not at all. Um, Working out with us. Darn little laptop. Um, so the only the only difference that I think is important for the other piece I wanted to just um, have folks be aware of who are watching or who may not be familiar with the construct. So the way that um, career and technical center funding works in Vermont is that it still is a tuition that the sending schools send to the career center based on enrollment. So um, since the Central Vermont Career Center became an independent district, folks actually get a separate ballot. We actually all got separate ballots this past town meeting day and always will to approve that budget, but it's not an additional budget. It's actually a budget that then is paid as part of like, so the Montpelier Roxbury budget includes our career center portion of that budget. Um, so we will, when it gets closer to budget season, the superintendent and director of the career center, Jody Emerson, she's come before the board in the past, will come and do a much better presentation for you all on the budget, um, our enrollment, um, and our needs and and explain again how that sort of that tuition funding works. There's definitely been rumblings in the legislature about changing how that model works, but for right now that's the methodology that it's using. So even though we're an independent district, um, it's funded still on that tuition based um, offering. Um, the other thing I thought it would be helpful to mention to the board is um, and to the public is as we're thinking like really big picture long-term, we started to have some of those conversations. We've got the RFP out there. The Career Center also very much is looking for a future home. And I just thought that's like helpful additional context for like the Center of Vermont community to kind of be aware of that that's also sort of floating out there. Um, there are also some like on-site possibilities for the Career Center programs. So they do, for example, they have a design and fabrication course that is actually at the Barry Granite Museum. So it's offsite. But, you know, anytime you have like offsite programs, there's transportation and supervision and all these other sort of logistics um, that are challenging. So ideally, we'd still be able to have sort of a centralized for all the 18 towns, um, a central Central Vermont Career Center. Um, another thing I thought was helpful for Montpelier Roxbury folks to be aware of is because of the space limitations there currently, um, a lot of students actually don't get in. There's there's a um, there's far more students that apply than actually get to participate in a lot of the programs because of um, the physical space and then the the ability to supervise students. And of course, this this is supervising students using like construction tools and welding equipment and lifts and things like that for um for auto. So um, there's a lot more safety concerns for for the career center too. So supervision is really important. Um, so yeah, I just sort of wanted to give a quick refresher in that context. Um, it's an honor to serve you all as your representative on it. It is a lot of work. It's a second board, right? With our own negotiations, our own budgets, our own um, <clears throat> challenges, but um, it's really exciting to be a part of it. It's really neat to see the course of studies expand. Um, there's a digital media arts program that is um, has been very successful in getting some really fantastic equipment. Um, through grants and things like that. Um, they have a partnership with Habitat for Humanity. Um, there's just a lot of really neat things happening there um, that's really neat to be a part of. Um, and it's just something I wanted our community to kind of be aware of. So um, I will maybe try to figure out how to send the, the website is fantastic and has 
every possible update about how the district was formed, the students, the attendance by school district. So how many students from Montpelier Roxbury go, how many students from Spalding, Harwood, Twinfield Cabot and so on go, um, the courses of study and then the outcomes for students. Um, I think it's really neat how we've been able to actually capture like where students end up six months after they leave, how many students are doing, um, like they do a year at the career center, maybe they'll do early college. So it's just another sort of option for students in the higher, um, the higher grades that is just part of that broader sort of personalized learning that um, that Vermont is doing. I'm happy to answer any questions, but just wanted to put that out there because there's a lot of new faces and members of the community that may not be aware that we're part of that district. Awesome, thanks, Jill. Um, and again, thanks for serving on the board. I know it's a lot of work. Uh, questions for Jill? Mia. Who's the chair of that board? <laughs> I am the chair. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> just checking. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm um, I'm serving as the chair right now. I do have uh, we do have a vice chair, and the idea is, and I'm going to hold him to it that um, I'm going to not always be the chair, and that that the next time around, I will happily support someone else in the chair role. Um, I'm happy to do it, but it it is just another level of work. Um, and as folks on this board know, negotiations and all those other sort of subcommittees can really take a good deal of time too. But yeah, I'm currently the chair of the Center Vermont yes. Career Center. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you thank again. You. Jill, I'm curious how much the board has spoken with Jody and the administration around making um, CVCC a full day program and its influences on the sending schools. Yeah, so um, we had uh, the Center Vermont Career Center had a recommendation for um, to move to a full day program. Um, which expands the number of minutes that the students are there. That is not in place this year. Um, but the idea is actually that that career center day will be longer and that, that the career center will actually be able to hire some um, teachers for some of those core programs um, so that students can actually come and actually be there for the day. Um, I think Jody would be much better at sort of explaining the ins and outs of that, but that is definitely the plan. Um, and it was actually sort of, like I said, it was a recommendation from, I can't remember the entity that does these sort of oversight and recommendations for the board, but um, but that is definitely something that has implications for the sending schools too. Right now, the transportation is probably one of the single biggest challenges. Um, and right now those students might be there until like noon and then they're coming back. And then at that point, especially students going to like Cabot or Harwood, how much of their school day are they really getting once they're driven back to their sending schools? Um, but we should have Jody come in and actually come in and talk to you folks about like what that looks like and what some of the challenges are there. Um, and as you can imagine, the same challenges that we experience in Montpelier Roxbury, we also experience at the Career Center as far as like hiring and and finding folks for positions. It's been a really challenging. Um, yeah. Uh, Jake. Thanks. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, my question Jill, um, first of all, thank you for your work on that board. Um, I think tech ed is, you know, incredibly important and a really important tool, um, you know, important option for students. Um, my question is, um, what what is like, can you quantify the amount of students who are interested in the career center, but maybe aren't able to participate because of the space? is the first part of the question. And the second part is like, if there was going to be a bigger space is, do you have any kind of vision about, you know, where it would be, how big would it be? Would it need a lot of specialized equipment, like that kind of thing generally? Um, yeah. And so we do have some information on our annual report, which if you're on the cvtcc.org homepage, there's a really good annual report um, that I can share with the board that articulates. So over the past three years, the number of applicants for the positions versus the number of um, students that can actually participate. So it, in the past, for this current year that we're in right now, um, we have about 300 students applying for about 240 seats. Um, and it's been similar. Last year it was over 300 applicants for that 245 seats. So um, we are turning away uh, you know, dozens of students every year for some of the programs. Um, 
I think the big pieces, uh, and again, Jody will do a much better job at, at I at articulating some of the needs, but, but yeah, so there's a combination of safety needs, right, for these particular programs. Like we would love to have welding. The, the community has been really clear that there is a high need. A lot of the businesses in the central Vermont area are willing to actually like sponsor and host programs like um, diesel mechanic, um, the welding. Um, there's a lot of those that need in our community and they'd be happy to host it, but there's like safety and regulatory reasons why that's a challenge. Um, so, and I do think, like I was saying, there's definitely opportunities that we're exploring now for that sort of offsite embedded location based training. So like the cosmetology two students might actually open a salon that's in town somewhere so that they can actually do that work on site too. So you can be creative, but generally um, more classrooms and then, um, you know, the equipment needs are important. It's actually pretty impressive how good equipment the Career Center can get from donations and grants and things like that. Like we're actually sharing an ambulance with, um, with I think it's the Barry Town Emergency Management District um, for the, because there's several um, adult education and student related EMS courses that like we can all take some of these adult edge courses there as well. Um, and so then you can also have better supervision of students with the right classroom. So a combination of more classrooms and then more actual space. I mean, the, the construction um, building trades, they actually have like a big space where they're building dugouts and things like that, but, and it's inside, which is great because in Vermont, you know, our gear is for outdoor work would be challenging. So, but it doesn't have to be some grand, spectacular, massive facility. A lot of it is really comes down to still just like classrooms with good supervision capabilities for students. Um, and it would be great to have it more centrally located. So the students are, like I said, they're Cabot, Twinfield, um, Harwood, Barry U32, um, Montpelier Roxbury. Um, is there a location that would be easier for students and less prohibitive for them to get themselves um, to the Career Center? Um, and then we also are using space at Central Vermont Medical Center for some of those courses. Um, they actually supported a phlebotomy training for students to help with blood draws and things like that. So that was another thing that happened this past year. So there's a lot of really neat things you can do creatively without physically having the space, but you still wanna have the space so that that, that um, medical professions teacher can actually host things in a classroom, show students um, that work in a classroom environment before they actually are going out into the field. Um, yeah. Scott, quick question for you. Um, I, I think I heard you mention something similar uh related um are there like dual enrollment um courses run through the tech center or are students taking advantage of dual dual enrollment with um some of the institutions of higher learning in in vermont yeah so some of the courses that they take here can actually count towards um towards like college credentials or work credentials yeah um, and some students might take like a year of natural resources or something and then go to do an early college program. There was a there was a slide on here about the percentage of students or the number of hours of actual college credits they're getting by being nice. here. Um, because there's a lot of they're called fast forward college credits and mm -hmm. industry recognized credentials. So like if a student does two years of electrical, they have a huge leg up yeah. when they actually go to get that that industry okay. certification. Um, but yeah, we do have documentation about the um the college and career credits. So like some of them can get dual enrollment, like the medical professional ones can actually get credits through CCV. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of um and yeah, it, that's what's kind of neat too. There's also the co-op program, which is sort of placement in a particular um like on-site position. So people can try things out and um and sometimes the students can actually even earn money while they're working at those. Um yeah. And it looks like th this for 2022-2023, um, Montpelier had 35 kids in some aspect of the of the um, career center work, which is pretty good. Um, yeah, and like I said, there are some adult education programs, um, like um, CPR and things like that. Um, that's part of the requirement for career centers is that they also are able to host adult education and deal with that for the community. So there's that as well. And let me know if you have any other questions or. What is what is kind of the latest on the possible facility? I know they've been talking about that for a while. Yeah, there's not a location picked out. There's it's a long way from a reality. 
Um, the facilities subcommittee is really hoping it could be like a three to five year plan because we've really outgrown our space. You know, we're leasing space from Spalding and Spalding also needs space too. Yeah. So it's kind of, there's this tension there right now. Um, and like I said, we're turning away a lot of students. The, um, the culinary um, folks are really kind of crowded in their space. So there's not like natural light and they're, you know, they're working pretty close quarters. So there's, um, there's a pretty high need. And obviously the more students that can participate, you know, that's, that's helpful for everybody. Um, but it is kind of in earnest. They're definitely looking, um, trying to see, you know, there's a lot of commercial buildings in the area that may not be used that way and could be, you know, repurposed. Um, there's, you know, I think we're always sort of keeping our eye out for, for local land, but of course, yep. so is everybody else. <laughs> Um, and it's also kind of interesting having that sort of maybe this funding structure will change in the back of our minds, making sure that, you know, we're making smart decisions there, but, um, but it's getting pretty urgent to find some space. Um, and, and even things like this year, um, and I think Montpelier High School already managed it. There's the stormwater mitigation work that requires changes to parking lots and things like that. So the career center Spalding student and faculty parking lot. Um, is about to get a lot smaller too. So like there's some very sort of immediate literal space needs um, that are pretty challenging. But yeah, that's the hope is like a three to five year plan. Yeah. I'm sure that really quickly, and this is just a crazy idea, but I'm sure there's a lot in terms of the like um, infrastructure bill and there's a lot of money, federal money in, in workforce development. And so I'm, I'm curious if there would be like infrastructure funds that could be tapped in. Yeah. And I believe the governor did allocate some of the education fund surplus for career center development for exactly that reason. But I don't know what that's actually translated to for Center Vermont. But I think that is kind of the hope, right? Is that we know desperately how much we need um, housing um, in Vermont, for example, and that these are the professionals that, I mean, the students that graduate from this have employers like waiting yes. for them. And some like will like steal yeah. them out of the program the second they can, because they're a well-trained, um, competent student. So a lot of these students get, um, you know, I think it's about uh, just over 50% immediately start already employed in the field that they were studying at the Career Center, which is pretty great. Um, and a lot go on to um, post-secondary education as well. Um, so the, the um the employers are really anxious to help however they can too. Um yeah. Other questions? Right. Um we've been trying to improve our ability to communicate with the community. Um I can imagine it's really challenging for CVCC. I'm not sure exactly what my question is, but um do you find that there's it's tough to have a dialogue with family member with families when it's scattered over such a vast distance i mean yeah i think um i think because the legacy was that it was part of the Barry unified union district it's very much still feels that way so if you go to the career center open house which is a blast there's a silent auction and it's all these things that students have made like beautiful woodworking and things like that it's pretty awesome it's packed. Yeah. It's packed with families. It's packed with students. Um, but I definitely think it still feels like it's, it's like the Barry location and it's a lot harder for families from some of the farther afield places to, to go there. Um, so, uh, last year, again, because it was sort of the first year of this, this new district, um, Jody and her team created some really helpful, like this, Thing that I'm totally using as a cheat sheet, like annual report and visuals to, to and then they actually mailed out, um, ma did a mailing to the 18,000 or maybe it's 36,000 voters to really try to be clear about what is and isn't in the career center and that this is now your district, that because it's not a career center under the Barry Unified District, it is the center of Vermont district and we all have voices at that table um, that folks have that ownership over it. Um, but but yeah, I still think it's it still feels a little like sort of isolating from some of the other towns. Yeah. Maybe we can, if we have some success, we can share 
or yeah. vice versa. Vice versa. You know? Yeah, absolutely. That was why. And I'm totally talking out of turn because I don't have any um, preconceived notion, but it just struck me like as we're all talking about sort of the future, the next 10, 20, 30 years of the Sancho Vermont education landscape that that I wanted to make sure that this was sort of part of that conversation and that this need is out there. And um, I don't know if someone's bequeathing a property in the center of Vermont area to the career center, um, then uh, they're actively seeking spots to move to. Yeah. I'll tweet on Mackenzie Scott. See if can yeah, that. there you go. Good idea. That was great news. Yeah, I'd love to, I'd love to see, and I, I'm sure, uh, you know, labor and the governor's office and other folks are working on connecting that sort of housing demand and the need for those skilled workers with the career centers across the state. Um, Cause that seems like a pretty good matchup. Um, and it's really also challenging to find the industry professionals who teach at the career center. Cause certainly they have there, there's so much demand for that work that it takes a special person to want to actually sort of step away from that. And a lot of them do continue to work in their profession outside of the, the school semester, but um, we really want to keep those folks that the students are learning from really strong instructors. Yeah. Kristen. Great, Kristen. Hi, thanks. <clears throat> yeah, Jill, thank you so much for all of the extra time and effort that you put into this role and always keeping us informed. Um, <clears throat> I wondered if Jill or Libby, because I anticipate that we will get a, a budget presentation or kind of an overview of what the Career Center's budget will look like in the coming year or proposed budget. Can you just, can could either of you give us like a succinct brief, if possible, uh, reminder on kind of just like people waiting as it relates to the budget and kind of how that gets you know, divvied up and spread across since we have, you know, students at least who currently, and maybe it sounds like not in the near future, but currently we have students that, you know, spend a portion of their day at Montpelier High School and then transition to the career center. So just how does the pupil waiting and the um, kind of distribution of like per pupil cost work across our two institutions? I can take a stab at it. Um, so, so basically there's sort of a rolling enrollment average and that's what the tuition is based on. So one of the, one of the slides on this annual budget presentation is what each district pays into the center Vermont career center. And also what, um, what the other career center tuition is around Vermont. Um, so our tuition isn't quite as high per student as some of the others, but it's also, um, similar to a lot of things that happen in education funding, it's sort of cushioned a bit. So the enrollment has gone up higher than that um, than that enrollment amount. So the career center is not getting dollar for dollar, student per student each year. It, it's a little bit um, graduated as time goes on. Um, so basically, and when Jody will come back, it looks like our presentation on this last time um, is still up on their website as well that she gave to this board. Um, the, then we come into with sort of an announced tuition, and then that is what the sending districts can calculate based on that enrollment projection. Um, let's see. So, for example, the announced um, FY twenty four, which we're in right now, is a little is eighteen thousand seven hundred and forty eight. Um, However, a lot of that comes right from the education fund from different state tuition. So then the sending schools pay a portion of that. Oh, it's based on a six semester average of FTE. So like if a, like if we have 40 students there from Montpelier Roxbury, it might be based on like 38 or something like that. Um, it's pretty complicated. <laughs> Thank you for that refresher. That does all ring a bell, but it's nice to yeah. kind of pre-think about that in advance of, of Jody coming. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. So, so if we were, so if the Career Center is to take on, um, is to be able to create a uh, a full day program that would also include their core academics, does that mean that, so that like, I guess, would we still rely on like the six semester average? Yeah, that's part of the current state statute. That's part of the the state construct. So unless the legislature changes it, that would still be the case. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Hmm. 
Other questions? No, right. thanks again, Jill. Yeah. Thank you guys for the time. Yeah, no, and I look forward to hearing more from Jodine as the process moves forward. Um, so goal review. Uh, first off, again, a big thanks to Libby for covering us some time with her team to give this some attention. Um, do you want to talk us through your thinking? Sure. You want to start? Sure. So um, the link that's in the board agenda is something I just put together is something that could go up on our website potentially um, as to how we might want to do this that could last more than just a year. Um, so we want, we'd have things in one place. Um, talking to, so where you see like, if everybody pulls that up, the, I can actually share my screen. That's probably easier, isn't it? <laughs> Hold on. Um, so where it says 2023 fall data literacy, 2023 fall data math, that, that would be a link to, to our data. Um, so you, we'd be able to link that in and then have the district goals in here. The leadership team really went down, had a really excellent conversation about what, um, this could be for the school board and where we landed was that the school board's level for a goal should be very high, should be way up here um, and not in the weeds. And that the weeds are kind of the touch points to, towards getting towards that goal. Um, so they did land, the team did land on using uh, Vermont CAP, the Cognate Assessment, which was formerly the SVAC, as um, the right indicator for the board to be looking at, not as a sole indicator, um, you can see my comment on the side, uh, be clear about what the touch points are for the board throughout the year to show that we're actually, we're getting towards the the stated goal by 2026. So we played around with two different place, two different ideas, um, a straight percentage that by 2026, 85% of our students will show proficiency in literacy on the, on the Vermont cap and in math. We chose 85% because uh, RTI research shows that first instruction should create 85% proficiency in, in students um, with 15% needing more support. So that's why we landed on the 85%. Um, or another way to look at it, um, and I think the preferred way for the leadership team would be from our growth measure um, that will increase our proficiency in literacy by 5% each consecutive year as a district and by 10% each consecutive year um, in math. The reason why we landed on those percentages is because while the VCAP scores are still embargoed for some unknown reason, because you will all be able to see the district and state level scores on the student reports if you have a student in third grade through ninth grade that we sent out this week. If you haven't gotten them yet, you will get them probably tomorrow. Um, we're not allowed to talk about them publicly yet. <laughs> um, and our literacy scores are pretty high. Uh, and so we, we by 2026, it was a reasonable request for 5% with the high, with how high our district-wide scores are. Um, our math has more to grow, which is why the percentage would be a bigger uh, percent increase in growth. Um, and then we would want the board to think about how they're gonna support us in that work. Um, so that would be your your uh, row to fill out if we were going to use a form like this. And then each of these with yearly progress would be links to board reports and data reports so that it all be in one place. So just I just wanted to explain what this whole chart was and what our progress was each year. Um, and then in the belonging, safety and wellness, the team actually met and talked about this today. And because I'm in Rhode Island for a different board meeting um, earlier today, I was not part of this. However, I have it on good authority that it was a wonderful conversation. Um, and they really dug into the Panorama student surveys that we just had the kids take uh, and the belonging indicator on that. The kids um, reflected on their sense of belonging. And what we came to is that there'd be a yearly increase of 10% uh, 10% in the percentage of students in grades three through 12 who report a feel of sense of belonging in a panorama survey. 
it's an interesting growth indicator because some schools have a lot of room to grow and some schools have very little room to grow um, or some grade levels have very little room to grow. So like 10% over three years would get us to 100% at UES, for instance, in our third and fourth graders. Um, and this isn't an or, but an and uh, by 2026, we still want that chronic absenteeism to be looked at as a goal. Um, in terms of belonging, safety, and wellness, because there's so many correlations between high absentee rates and student success in both academics and belonging, safety, and inclusion. So we'd still we still feel that that's a very important goal to have under this indicator. So those are the two areas, or those are the two things that they came up to with belonging, safety, and wellness. Um, we did not talk about community engagement and accountability because we are still kind of unclear as to whether this was a board's goal or if this was an administration goal. Um, so because we were unclear on that, we didn't talk about it uh, too much. We can talk about it. Uh, certainly, we didn't avoid it in any way, but we just weren't really clear about what the board's desire or who the focus of this indicator was on. Um, so we wanted to get clarity on that first. That's the rhyme or reason that we have. Great, no, thanks for the work on this. Um, and I definitely like the idea of staying at high levels. Uh, thoughts, comments? I should probably take a little time to answer that question about the community engagement piece. Sounds good. Um, yeah, I'm just curious about what the 2023 data is. I know that isn't available yet. Is the 2022 data anywhere on the chronic absentee data and the student survey? We didn't take student surveys last year. So we so this year would be the baseline data for the panorama surveys on belonging specifically. Oh, Laura, you should have taken one. <laughs> <laughs> if not, let Jason know. <laughs> we'll make sure you do. Um, <laughs> and the um, the chronic absenteeism, we were at 34% last year as a district. Okay, that's good to know. Thank you. And how does 34% compare to historic data? We hadn't collected it until last year. With, with Nick coming on board, um, he, he's the one who really, um, taught us how connect. I mean, we obviously knew or had a hunch of the correlation between if you're not in school, you're not learning obviously. Um, but he really painted the picture for the administrative team and made it rise to the level of us paying that much more attention to it. So this, is, oh, I'm sorry, Alara, <laughs> Miriam, I called you Alara. I'm sorry. Jim's like, no wrong name. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Miriam. Um, so uh, because of Nick Connor's work, uh, particularly, and then we were in COVID when he first came in, like we just didn't have chronic absenteeism data before this. Um, so last year was our, was our baseline year. It might help as folks yeah. are looking at these and, and internalizing these goals to once again, reminder, at Libby included in our packet, the document that has mission, vision, priorities. So that, you know, that's a good reminder that you can be looking at that for all of the work or the culmination of all of the work leading up to this conversation tonight. And then I also wanted to bring in um, the, the input that we got. I mean, I know we got a lot of input at various points across the process, but because not every board member was able to make it to the fall festival, I thought I would share the yeah, um, post the giant post-it notes with folks just to bring in the comments that we got and the input that we got in that particular venue, just to make it part of the conversation. So we asked people what they would like to see us accomplish within these three priority areas. And I'll just read them out loud. Number one priority area being close the academic gap. Our first is a focus on academic achievement and recognition 
and honors programs like National Honor Society. Um, we got a few ideas. Um, I believe these were from students, which is great. Bring pets to school day and a class pet, although I might put those in belonging safety and wellness and not academics. <laughs> um, more fun learning, more less worksheets, more games, less standardized testing, uh, focus on quality professional development and coaching for for educators and continued rigor to challenge all kids, especially at the middle school in middle school opportunities. So you can see even in, you know, we were gathering all kinds of input. So ideas for things that could happen on a daily basis or maybe once a year, like bring your pet. And then we also got things that were a little bit more high level, like focus on um, academic achievement and rigor and challenge. So that's what came to us in the first priority. And then our sheets of paper overlapped each other. So I need to get your other one out for belonging, safety, and wellness. Some ideas that we received were um, anti-fat bias awareness and eating disorder prevention for faculty, staff, parents and students, mental health and social media. Um, they would like washing sinks in the cafeteria at the middle school, longer recess at UES. There were three or four requests for that one. Allow caregivers to eat in the cafeteria again, um, more reading, uh, social emotional learning curriculum for K through 12, outside time options, um, more outside education, um, the KRS kindness, responsibility, and safety, um, the KRS being the UES um, sort of motto, and get back the, the recess, get back to a 25 to 30 minute recess. So those were ideas that we got and requests that we got under belonging, safety, and wellness. Again, most of those getting more into like the nitty gritty, how we might live out a goal or accomplish a goal, but thought that it would be, it's good to bring these ideas into the room. And then on the third um, one, uh, community engagement and accountability, we got a suggestion for Winooski River cleanup to bring that back. I guess that used to be a big thing to engage kids in more environmental issues outside and the lip sync battle. <laughs> so anyway, wanted to make sure that that all was part of our thinking. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, everyone who attended Fall Festival. That's fine. And, yeah. Yeah, that was a great day for it, too. Um, I have a question on the attendance goal, which just, I would, I think, kind of goes to wellness. But, you know, kind of one of the things we realized with COVID is, you know, maybe rethinking our culture of like kind of plugging through a cold and coming coming in anyways and, you know, sniffling next to your, you know, workmate or fellow student. Um, like, like, how do we balance that? I mean, how do we encourage people to kind of stay home, take the time they need to get well, not spread it to the entire class with, you need to be in, in school. And do we have data that, and, and, or an indication about what's really causing absenteeism. Is it that, I mean, because if it's because people are staying home because they're sick and shouldn't be around people, then maybe we shouldn't be encouraging them to come to school. But if it's other reasons, then clearly it's a problem. I don't think there's one answer to that. I think it's a very good question. Um, oh, uh, and a challenge that I don't think we r really could answer that other than subjectivity and opinion. So just put that out there, right? I think Nick probably is a much better person to answer than I am. I can say, however, that there's a variety of reasons why kids are out. Um, and uh, like I was looking pretty in depth at the attendance data on Panorama just yesterday because we with pa Panorama is like the most amazing thing that the board has ever decided to do. So thank you for voting that into the budget. It was phenomenal. It's phenomenal. And we're just playing around with what it can do, which is now our data warehouse, um, our data piece for those who don't know what Panorama is. And, and um, what I love about it is that it's at my fingertips now and I can look at it, right? And so there are, you know, you go all the way from there's approximately 
10 kids in our district who have missed 17 days of school. I mean, think about, we've been in school for 24 or something like that. Like, and, and so like, that is not a common cold, right? They're, they are not missing school because they have a cold. Um, and some of those families were on trips. Some of those families were call every day and say, Oh, they bumped themselves last night. They can't come to school in the morning, you know? So it's really all over the place with those families and those that's Nick's caseload, right? Nick is all over that. Um, for support of the families that are moving into more truancy than support. Um, And then we have a lot of kids who have been out probably the five to 10 day range. Um, And those are really worrisome. That's, that's, you know, when you get to 10, you're at almost half the school year out already. And those are pretty much getting blamed on common cold kind of stuff. Um, For the most part, I don't want to totally yeah. generalized because Nick would have that information far more. But th- those are the ones that Nick's on the phone with saying, hey, you got to come to school. Let's talk about what we can do to support you. And I think people's opinion of what, um, and I know I'm, I'm speaking as a superintendent, as, as a parent right now, <laughs> with two kids who, one kid in particular who like walks by another person and gets a cold, um, of of making that decision in the morning of when to send your kids to school and when not to send your kids to school and what's safe and will they wear a mask if they're there and if they don't you know you know there's so many questions for parents these days that it's not easy and it certainly is a different mental thought process than it was prior to covid that is 100% accurate so to, this is a rambling answer jim that doesn't really give you an answer cuz i i'm not positive how we how we talk about it just yet other than the data that we have is so crystal clear that when kids miss a lot of school then they don't feel like they belong in their classroom and we have the data to support that they don't feel like they belong in our school system they don't feel included they have trouble with more trouble with friends they have more trouble with behaviors they have more trouble with academic everything adds up on the on kids when they miss a considerable amount of school so it's really just, we know they should be in school. So how do we balance this need for public safety, public health safety, and being in school at yeah. the same time? It's a, it's, I, I don't have an answer, like a clear answer yet. Yeah, that makes sense. I know me as a follow-up. And yeah, I think there's probably only so much information we get, but it seems like knowing, knowing why kids are not in school, you know, if, if, if they're, anxious about coming to school and that's keeping them from school that's very different than you know if they just got the flu a couple times and you know end up tipping into that chronic absenteeism thing but everything else is fine right i mean you get covid and the 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 directive is still to stay home for that five days you know like which at this point you'd be chronically absent right (laughs) so there there is there is there are still public health things that happen that would would tip the scale for a kid, most definitely. Yeah. Uh, Mia, it looks like we have Jake and I uh, just saw Emma come on camera, so she may. So I'm curious, Libby, how you all landed on the number, the percentage of 20, because that's still a fifth of our students being chronically absent. Is that more just like, that's the progress we think we could make in two years toward an even lower number? Or is, you know, how did you get there? It's just more realistic. Um, and that number came from Nick. I actually had, when I just brainstormed myself before, like I wanted to, the leadership team to react to ideas rather than um, come up with them. So I had a lower percentage down there and Nick was like, no way. And he is, he's a leader in this space. Um, so I trust that he's, he's looking at national trends and that kind of thing as well. Um, and, and that's, he, he said 20% is a realistic number for us to get to. Yeah, because you had in your continue, continuous improvement plan 10, but that was before we had baseline data of 34. Right. So is 10 really more the ideal and we want to get there eventually? Do you know? It, yeah, it would be ideal, I think. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Jay? My question um, is, well, the first one is, um, is Pickup Patrol, the app feeding Panorama? Like how, where, where is Panorama getting the data about why people are absent? Um, so and that's then, reported by parents when they call. It's not Pickup Patrol. Oh, because when my kid's sick, I do Pickup Patrol and then I enter like home sick or something. 
Yeah. So that, that might feed into, that's brand new this year. So that might be feeding it in for UES, but that's not a common thing across the district either. Oh, okay. Um, and then the second part is like, um, you know, I wonder if there's like a, a, a better statistic about absenteeism, such as like per day, um, you know, a certain proportion of students are out for like an unexcused, you know, like an un, you know, a reason that's not like being sick or something like maybe that's the, the thing to look at. Like, I don't know what the number would be, but, you know, people who are out just because they're out, you know, without a without a good reason or maybe the people who are out are making up some. Yeah, other that's that's out. the challenge. That's the challenge. So, you know, a, a kiddo who's got 17 absences um technically they're all excused right okay. and if a parent reports they're excused then they're you know like that's so that's it's, what it's it's not always it's not always a, a logistic like i i can i know what you're saying like my my kid olena last year was had covid and then she had rsv and she was you know like the first four months of school she's been out 10 days and so like i like but that's legit you know she was sick um but that's not always the case, I think, uh, with absenteeism. And are there kids who are like sort of totally off the radar who are like absent, but we have no idea why? We do not have too many of those right now because we have Nick in his position. Um, there, we I can honestly say prior to prior to hiring a community liaison with the skill of what Nick Connor has, we had plenty of those. Now we do not. Um, he knows, he knows where kids are. Okay, thanks. Emma. Um, thank you, Libby, for getting this feedback from the administrators. It's really helpful to have another starting point. <clears throat> um, I think this is a question for Mia and Jim, but what is... What's sort of the ideal timeline for finishing these goals up? I'm just wondering how much time we have to sort of sit with these um, recommendations and mix them up with our own brainstorming. I mean, I think that's kind of a question for the board as a whole. Uh, I think we'd like to finish them sooner rather than later. Um, but we also don't want to rush. I, I mean, it, my initial take on these are these are relatively consistent with the direction we're headed. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I think we need to take the time we need moving with, you know, a sense of purpose. Okay, so we'll maybe expect to see some time. It's not tonight, is what I'm asking. Like, we're expected to see oh, some we don't, time. No, we don't, we, on I think... Agenda. Yeah, maybe maybe even like the next meeting we can carve out some time to to go through these. Um, and it seems like we've got a little bit of work to do. Which when we wrap this up, we should probably take five to ten minutes to talk about about the um, community engagement piece. Um, but yeah, no, let's let's on a near meeting take a chunk and and finish these. Okay, so, that sound right? Any anyone feeling differently? Yeah, perfect. I just have a couple of questions I'm going to go through. So on the um, academic achievement one, I definitely favor the second growth angle better than, you know, over the flat percentage. Um, and then I'm wondering with for the <clears throat> for the second bullet point there, it's actually the fourth bullet point or whatever, by spring of 2026, increased proficiency in math by 10% each consecutive year. I was just thinking, I mean, maybe this is getting too granular, but I'm just thinking, um, I'm trying to clarify, like, I think by 2026, we're wanting to see a 10% increase from the baseline now. Good question, Megan. Mia, you're, I'm sorry, you're completely right. That doesn't make sense grammatically. <laughs> we were thinking each consecutive year between now and 2026, we'd see a 10% increase. Okay. And so then like, I, I don't think it actually adds up to 30% total, but like that's sort of the goal is to get it up that much higher. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, that would be our goal. But good point out. You're 100 percent correct. And I should have I've read these 7000 times. You think I would have picked up on that? Well, I wasn't sure. Like, do, are we just like waiting until 2026 and then kind of. OK, so clarified um, in belonging, safety and wellness. I was wondering if your team discussed any um, like the staff sense of belonging, safety and wellness um, in our brainstorm at the last meeting when we worked on these, we were talking about staff and students. And I'm just wondering if they discussed that. We did not, we only discussed students. Okay, so kind of like the next one, the community engagement, it might be something to consider. Like, do we want this goal to in be inclusive of staff or are we really focused on students this time around? Um, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I thought I was interrupting someone. No. Um, and you, I think Miriam already asked about, so the 10%, we don't have a baseline for that yet, right? Okay. We do, um, we, we know it internally. We are not allowed to say it externally as of yet. You okay. will, as soon as you get um, Sworn and Petra's results, you'll, you'll know where we are as a district, so. Well, this is the panorama. This is the, sorry, belonging, safety, and wellness that there will be a yearly increase of 10% in the percentage of students in grades yeah. three through 12. Who, yeah, so that, we, have, we have that, Emma. We um, want to make sure that we're on, it's different for each school. So we don't have a district score right now. And I don't think we would show this by district because the, what a third grader reports and what a 10th grader reports are yeah. two very different things. Um, and so- I think we'd probably show this by school rather okay. than by district. Yeah. Okay. And then with the absenteeism, the baseline you said is somewhere around 35% currently. And then I wasn't sure, could you clarify what it means? Like um, the goal is written chronic absenteeism with no more than 20% of the student population at any given time in the year. Why was it written that way? Because because of kind of what Jake was saying that that absenteeism ebbs and flows throughout the school year, um, and so what we want to say like we can't say across a full year. We, what we want to say is like a, we want to look at different multiple points throughout the year so that we can show you where we are. Like it's kind of like the touch points from the academic data, um, and like. You know, for, last year we found out at looking at MHS's data, for instance, that for whatever reason, kids were out, were more chronically absent on Wednesday than any other day of the week. Like it was random. One would think Friday is the day, um, but it was random. So we want to get away from like daily stuff and look at where are we in points of the year and are there points of the year that we should be looking more, you know, that we need to pay more attention to this than others and wh what's it look like. Um, so that's why it's written that way. So it's not like a cumulative, like the 35% baseline isn't like over the course of a whole school year. That's sort of these different points throughout the year. I think that's pretty much the, uh, Nick would be a better person to answer, but I think that's the average of the year from last year because that's okay. how we took it from last year. Okay. That's my understanding of it. Okay. And then just... I'll put my thought into the hat on the community engagement and accountability piece. Like I was feeling that based on the feedback from our community members, you know, over the course of uh, my service on the board, I felt like this, um, this priority was inclusive of like the schools and the district and not just the board. So I would hope to see some of that reflected in the way that we write it. And that's it. Great, thank you, Emma. Uh, yeah. um, I'm curious just to like better understand the goals and the numbers around absenteeism, what strategies we've used in the past to try and reduce it, if you know. So because last year was the first year that we really started paying attention to this number because uh, it was the first year, technically, I guess, out of COVID, 
um, even though we were still in COVID very much. So it was the it was the first year that we really paid attention to it. And honestly, our strongest strategy right now is the community liaison position um, that has taken it away from straight a, a straight truancy report. Um, where parents get letters that we still have to send them because they're part of statute. But uh, Nick's position allows us to do a much more supportive route. Like, hey, your kid has been out for a few days. Talk to me about what's going on. What kind of supports do you need? Um, is there a transportation issue? Uh, he's also our homeless liaison. So he has, a, and he has more time for a homeless liaison than just adding on to somebody else's position. And so he's really in touch with our families who are living in motels um, or who are doubled up. So Nick is our biggest strategy right now and all of the things that his work encompasses. Um, and I don't want to I don't want to put it just in a in a person box, but he he really is on top of this. I think we need to think of other ways. Um, we have to figure out why kids aren't coming to school and in other ways to to encourage kids and families to be at school. Um, and I think it's part of it is to get better clarity from Department of Health and other places of what Jim was hitting on earlier around like, when do I send my kid to school? When don't I send my kid to school? Um, and that kind of thing. So we have a lot of work to do in this. Um, and Nick would be the one who's leading the more specific strategies around that. Great. Great. Oh, thanks, Mary. Scott, did you have a question? Yeah, uh, Libby, thank you very much for, for taking the time with, with your team to to look at these um, goals. Um, something you, you said right at the very end, you said something like, uh, if, if the kid's not in school, they're not learning or something like that. And, and when you said it, it kind of sat with me for a moment. I'm not exactly sure why. And then, and then Jim, as you were talking, I, you know, I was thinking about how we all, like in the way that we worked, has there's been a seismic shift right ever since the the uh, early days of the pandemic and so you know i i want to <laughs> just like interrogate that that comment a little bit cuz is it true really that if they're not in school they're not learning um and i don't know the answer to that but i suspect that there are ways and i'm i would be interested as a board for us to to consider how we can support the schools in various forms of learning that go beyond just the classroom. So in those cases where students are chronically absent because of illness, they can still be learning. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's more of a comment and and sort of a, a prompt, not prompt, uh, to, to kind of get us to think a little bit um, about what 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 learning means and what what virtual learning could be um and not be a um replacement for classroom learning but but a supplement too um i just want to throw that out there um and then also emma i i agree with that that last statement that you made you know in all of the other goals for the board we're we're talking about data of students um in the academic achievement and we're talking about belonging and safety wellness of the students and the and the community engagement piece I, I don't think it's just the board's community engagement i think we're really talking about the district as a whole including the board and the schools um and how we as a district um engage and so yeah i'd like to um you know continue that conversation and i know that we've been talking about how we as a board can help facilitate that and and yeah i think we, we can um be good partners in that Great. Emma, is that an old hand? Do you have another question? It's a new hand. Um, okay. I just was thinking when uh, Jake asked the question earlier about Nick, I thought it might be good. Um, and you kind of clarified a little, a little bit, Libby, who he is, but a little bit of historic context of like that was ESSER funding and social emotional learning investment and that it's a new position, but now it's board, you know, now it's funded in the part of the regular budget. And also Miriam, um, he gave us a really good presentation and I don't have at my fingertips like the date of that, <laughs> but we should be able to find it on Libby's document, right? Your planning, your agenda planning document. We could find the date there and then we could find the um, video on our website. But I think it's definitely worth watching for those of you who aren't familiar with um, his role in the school, because it's one of the like 
I don't know, most exciting things for me personally that came out of ESSER funding. Um, and over the last couple of years, it seems to really be making a difference. We yeah, also did a podcast with me last year. That was very good. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you have another question? Yeah. Well, I wanted to offer some feedback. And this would be, I think, so, so suggestions for us to consider as we are working toward finalizing this goal. I, I am fine with us not doing it tonight because I understand that these are important and um, we should take our time. But I also would like us to get to a point where we actually have goals and yes. not just be talking about goals. So um, I want to offer some suggestions for how to beef these up a little bit. And then we could maybe incorporate them in for the next time we look at them. Um, if people agree that they they should be in here. Um, so I wanted to bring in the um, the like inclusivity and equity piece and and try and work in somehow like all kids regardless of identity and socioeconomic status was the phrasing we had in several of our earlier versions of goals. And I think that's important to have in here so that it's a reminder to us that we should be paying attention to that stuff when the board is looking for the touch points along the way and that we're not just looking at the district as if they're as if you know it's like neutral on those things because there are still discrepancies in how in in both academics and belonging when it comes to identities and socioeconomic status so i just wanted to offer that as language we could work in to the final goals when we um, land on them. And then the other question I wanted to bring into the, the, the conversation was this piece that we heard both at the fall festival and then had heard in other conversations that we've been having as we've talked about these priorities, which is the, um, the you know, proficiency. Yes, absolutely. That is a huge marker. We need to be aiming for that, but then let's not aim for that at the like, detriment of kids who are proficient and need more challenge. So I wonder if it's like increase the level of kids who are proficient and above could be like the way that we phrase it in the goal. Um, I'm talking about the um, academic goals here. It, um, so that again, it's just the reminder to the board to be um, asking questions about and and um, thinking and, and thinking about when it comes to our investments that 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 piece um so wanted to offer those two things and see what folks thought about that yeah. those two components of how we might articulate these goals Jake? yeah i just have a question um in in next meeting or the one after are we planning to kind of look at the goals um, that we wrote um, side by side with the ones that Libby has today. Is that on? No, on let's the do that now. Let's do that now. Oh, that was yeah. A thought. yeah, cause the ones that we wrote in the last meeting are all in that document, the mission and yeah. vision approach values priorities. They're at the bottom of that document. So that, that's a great thing to do right now. Okay, thanks. I mean, that's very mindful of like, I mean, I think we said goals is kind of, these are some areas we want to work on. I I think that doesn't mean these are the only goals we have. And these are, you know, that we're working on a bunch of other things too. Um, like what do you, what well, would be an example? Yeah, an example, I think an example might be, you know, the, the challenging kids as well. Um, mm -hmm. like our goal could be to like, you know, that, that's something we want to do and, and, and an understanding of something we want to do. Um, but with the focus on like lifting the proficiency. So we're, we know that all students are getting a certain thing that right now we're not confident they're getting, um, with the idea that yes, we're working on making sure you know, students are challenged and, you know, students who are in advanced courses are getting those opportunities and and getting challenged um and that if if we don't explicitly say something that doesn't necessarily mean that it's not a priority and it's not on here mm -hmm.
And the academic ones are Yeah, and it's, it's some of the priorities may. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we want to we want to have academic excellence. I think across the board, uh, and I think academic excellence means a lot of different things. Kristen, thanks. Yeah, I wanted to respond to the first part. Uh, the question that, or kind of the idea that you had posed me, I also thought just in terms of um, in that first goal that we were really trying to kind of highlight and focus on the um, the academic achievement, like the gap piece, um, which, you know, feels different than, so yes, like wholesale, we would like to see, you know, X percentage of, you know, increases in proficiency, but I'm curious about how like panorama at this point to the extent that it's populated could also help us sort of uh to know that baseline data around um academic achievement gap and i know that we have to like always you know work with FERPA and the you know n less than 11 piece but is there because we several of these are, are kind of you know we just kind of went through piece by piece and talked about you know, the comparison of the goals with the baseline and does Panorama Libby at this point have um, data that could tell us more about the story of the existing achievement gap? We have our fall data in Panorama. Right now we have our fall data and we have VCAP scores in Panorama. We have, a, we have some of our spring data and from last year as well. Actually, I believe we have more than that. <laughs> we, have, we have our data from last year in Panorama and we have our data from this year in Panorama. And then that data could then be disaggregated in a particular way to kind of get at some more of these kind of equity um, questions or achievement gap questions to get some of that, like a baseline understanding of like, do we have an achievement gap? Um, you know, I, I always kind of come back to Libby. The that way goes that back to the, the spot on the thing that says, um, what are the board's touchstone points to show we're making growth here? So the board can name anything you want for those. And we would show you that data when we can, when the, when we have an end size that is appropriate. And I will tell you that for the board level, um, we do not have an end size that is appropriate for a lot of the categories that I know the board is interested in. We do for like across a district perhaps, but not by grade level. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does, yeah. Um, okay, yeah, so yeah, it seems like we we definitely do wanna wrap our head around that because it feels different than, you know, the goals that you have put up here, which seem, which are probably make a lot of sense, you know, but are really more kind of applied to the the whole of our students across the district versus, really targeting i mean do you Libby, and you you know this do the goals that you have currently stated as the district goals do those tend to achievement gap in your in your mind and in your expertise if we are to increase if we're if we have to go with uh the literacy increase increase uh five percent each consecutive year between now and 2026, we would be at an incredibly high literacy rate because we already are at a really high literacy rate. Um, and when you're at such a high literacy rate and you have such a low um, diversity in demographics in certain areas, then we would be we would be very close to closing achievement gaps um, because there'd be very few students who would be in that category of not being proficient. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, too? it does. And I'm now I'm like, trying to say I'm, I'm, I'm out without I'm like now being in AOE jail. <laughs> yeah, I'm remembering now these conversations that it was sort of like, you know, if it kind of, you know, sort of brings, it's like a, you scoop these students and then it kind of gives you a general sense. And I guess I'm just curious, like, and if we can't do it at a grade level, can we do it then at a district level? Yeah, that's why it says district. 
of these. Right. Goals. So, but like with the um, with the data that would really kind of tend to like the achievement gap pieces and like disaggregating, if we did it at a district level, would we be in compliance with FERPA given the numbers? Uh, for some categories, not all. For some categories. So I guess then the question, you know, for the board and with, you know, in collaboration with Libby and your team is, you know, seeing if we can articulate any goals that really specifically get at that, you know, that um, achievement gap piece, um, just more specifically. I think that if I had read this um, not being a board member and having a little bit of understanding of, of equity, I might be like, oh, but this doesn't really seem to kind of tease out like achievement gap. Um, just because I wouldn't have the explanation that you just gave me, which, and maybe that's an asterisk and there's an ex explanation of that. But I think maybe as a board and with kind of also your guidance, since you all really like know and, and you're living the data, you know, is there anything that we can um, create that just very specifically and clearly gets at the, uh, the gap piece? I just, I always go back to, you said it really succinctly at one meeting that we had that just sort of, you know, we know that there are certain sort of predictive, um, you know, markers for, you know, particular groups of students that we know most likely that that student will not be hitting this, this, and this, right? So like if we can, if, if, if anything within this goal area could get at that piece, I feel like we would be, we would more um, intentionally be hitting that gap piece that I feel like this goal was about. Can I, can I just throw in a, a thought here? I mean, one of the things that I think would be good is if we thought about the indicators that we've put forward, which I think are very good as informing the goals. So kind of looking at, you know, we have an indicator of systems are in place, or sorry, every, which one is the one I'm looking at? Any barriers based on identity of social status of students shall not predict economic success at MRPS. So for instance, that is an indicator that we have under closing the achievement gap. So any goal that we set under closing the achievement gap should really be informed by that, that indicator, which is going to be a little more evergreen. So if we set a goal of 85% and we're increasing that from you know 75 or 80 or wherever it now, uh, and you know, Libby comes and says, well, we hit our 85% goal. You know, because of, I think, the indicators we have, I think part of the question we should ask is, in terms of closing the achievement gap, for that goal to close the achievement gap, we should see that, you know, 10% improvement, you know, whether we choose the 85% or the growth, we should see that improvement coming in a way that shows that it's lifting all boats and all boats, you know, in, a, in an equitable manner. So... If if we can show that, then I think we have a good goal that meets the achievement gap, and I think everything Libby said makes sense. If we look at the numbers, and you know, it's it's just getting some privileged students that were, you know, straggling or not taking tests seriously to take those tests more seriously, then I think we say, well, given the indicators we have, that the meeting of that goal does not, as, as a whole, when married with our indicators mean that we're closing the achievement gap. We're just doing some cherry picking to get to a number. Does that make sense? I mean, I guess my fear is is having goals that are, you know, read like the IRS tax code. And I, I'm not sure that's super helpful. Jake. Yeah, I'm no fan of IRS tax code either. Um, <laughs> considering how much I have to deal with it. Um, but I think I think I agree um, that the eighty five percent district wide is not specific, and it doesn't say anything about closing a gap. No. In fact, I think that the gap could widen, and you could still hit the eighty five percent gap if I'm mathematically kind of playing it out correctly. So, wouldn't wouldn't you want to make your improvement goals like very specific to the population who you're trying to bring up. Yeah. Yes, but our data one, we'd have a we may have a hard time showing the board that because of FERPA. Because there's too few um 
because that, the size, yeah, the end size is too small. Is it is, is your limit ten or is it 11. something eleven? Yeah. And then are you talking about like poverty, like free and reduced lunch, or is it are you thinking about different groups? Um when you when you think of the eleven. So when Kristen was talking about how I said things succinctly, um, I haven't looked at the data this specifically in this cat in this way in a few years. But when I first took over, the data showed that if you were male, free and reduced lunch, and on an IEP, then you had very little chance of being proficient in our district. I, that's mm -hmm. that's an old statement. So I just want to put that out there. I don't know if that statement is it very well could be true now, but I haven't tested it. So I just want to make sure that's clear. <laughs> um, and that number of kids may be like if we were going to go there, right, that may be too low of an end size to truly um, to truly uh, be able to show good data to the board. Yeah. So, I mean, the I mean, I can understand from your perspective how the male and female might play into it. But I wonder if we're crafting goals and we're needing to see, you know, touch points to measure them. Could we do something like ignore the gender and, you know, to get a bigger end size that we could look at? Probably. Um, when I was at the agency of education, so I think, for example, um, you could have sort of the Venn diagram version of that, right? So like, how are our students who are on IEP doing versus non-IEP? How are our students, and I don't know how we'll measure free and reduced lunch exactly the same, but that was definitely a key constituent and then you can see on those different groups um because it is about closing the achievement gap right that we're trying to Im increase performance and not by lowering one to to go down but we're trying to raise that for everyone i would yeah. think we do have we would have it for those bigger cohorts cohorts of students like students on ieps or Free and reduced lunch. You would for students on IEPs and free and reduced lunch, probably not for race categories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I guess my question is how do we filter, how do we marry the indicators with goals? Because I think if we're marrying the indicators with goals, we can't get the, we. I mean, the situation that Jake pointed out, if you just had the 85%, totally true. We could just have, you know, certain demographics, especially given how small some of the demographics are in our school, fall through the floor and lift everyone else up and have this huge gap that we opened up. But if we do it consistent with our indicators, I don't think that's the case because our indicators very specifically state that these measures should not be, you should not be able to take an identity or a, a social group and pick it out and have it be notably different from others. Scott. And then I have a, a follow-up too. Yeah, to my the I, I also have a question about the the priorities and indicators. So in in that document that we put together, right, there's four or five, four bullet points for each of the the categories. Um and then Libby, what you provided with us, um, the goals Right, don't really get at all of the bullet points within our priorities. And yeah. so, yeah, I wasn't at the last meeting and the one before that I was driving. And so was the, did we ask Libby to focus on one particular part of um, each of those three goal, um, priority areas or, yeah. So I'm curious, like where the goals, how the other goals would fit in to in to the indicators and priorities listed within the three areas what other goals are you talking about so i would assume we would have other goals so the the second one by spring 2026 mrps increased proficiency level in, in literacy and math right the that's a very I, I like those goals but that doesn't address all four bullet points of closing the academic achievement gap that we've listed, right? Right. Yeah. I think the intent here is for there to be one set of goals for the pri for each priority, not one set of goals for every indicator. I guess I don't. So, like the barriers based on identity and socioeconomic status. That that question. Mm -hmm. How that goal that Libby and her team put together doesn't give me any information about how we are 
right. meeting that. Yeah. Right. So that was going to be my follow-up, which is why I was offering the language of regardless of identities or socioeconomic status to get inserted into the goal that the administration has offered us to bring that piece in because I agree it needs to be in there. And I I think, although I might be biased because it was my idea, that that's a way of keeping this goal top line, top, top level, high level at like board level um, without getting, you know, having either too many goals or, you know, like so many that it's hard to like figure out what we're actually um, aiming for. Because from the two meetings ago when we last talked about this, one of the concerns I raised is if we have too many goals, then nothing's actually a goal. We're just like, we want to work on everything. Um, and I, this is a part of it that was the full intent of this priority was to ensure that there is little to no gap anymore between between kids who have more privilege than others, kids who, you know, are already doing fine and the kids who need more support. Um, and so that was my offering to bring that into this top line goal was to include that um, phrasing so that when we have those moments where the administration comes to us with data and they say, hey, look, we're at 82%, we can say, that's great, that's district wide, tell us how that is based on identity and socioeconomic status, because that is also part of our goal. And if you're just giving us the, we're at 82% district wide without any other um, coloring to that, then, you know, we don't, we don't know if we're actually achieving that goal. So that was, that was my thinking behind offering that phrase. I, I, agree with that and i also i i just don't see most of what we have written in those bullet points reflected in the the goals that are um that that libby provided so go to the belonging safety and wellness right those four bullet points or five bullet points um how many of them would include um, chronic ab absenteeism. Or I'll ask the other way around. Does chronic absenteeism um, reflect back on all five of those bullet points? I would, I would argue not. So and Scott, so there, there are seven there under belonging, safety, and wellness. That's too many. So if you would no, like... He's talking about just the bullet points under the number two. We do have seven goals. If you go, if you scroll back up. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. He's talking like, about what are, you, what are you talking about? Lot more yeah. than <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for yeah. that. Larry. Yeah. And so it, if I totally agree that if we have too many goals, then, then yeah, then it's too much. I just don't see all five of those reflected in just that one metric of ab absenteeism well we have the two the district has the administration has put has proposing two goals under belonging safety oh, the wellness. panorama yeah gotcha Wait, oh hold on I, I just wanted to know emma has her has emma, her yeah, emma. emma um I mean, I, I I like Mia's suggestion of including the language, the um, equity language in there, bringing that back in. I also agree with what Scott is saying. Like, I think that based on what Libby just said and what, what Nick has told us around chronic absenteeism, that that particular goal might be better um, placed under the academic achievement. Um, because the whole thing is about, you know, they're not, like kids can't learn unless they're in school um so i don't know we can we can look at the bullet points more closely and make sure that they're tied um i wanted to go back to that the concept of like sort of the district reporting out to us on like free and reduced lunch and and that and the 11 um you know like 11 students would be too small of a, of a number to report out on but wouldn't we be able to you know if we wrote a if we wrote a goal 
with the language around, um, you know, reporting out based on equity factors, wouldn't you be able to report out district wide and not like school by school? And would that get around the, um, you know, too small of a sample size? So Kristen asked that earlier for certain demo for certain um, categories. Yes. Not all categories. Okay. So like free and reduced lunch, for example. Yes. We could report out on free and reduced lunch. Okay. And also you, and like, Students who self-identify as BIPOC was another one that you said you have like 35 kids in the district or something that, so I feel like that wouldn't, you know, if we have 35 students and we're only reporting out district-wide, wouldn't that be another one that we'd be able to report out on district-wide? Yes. If okay. that were the number and we were reporting out on district-wide stuff, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, I feel like we shouldn't like not write goals um, with that language because of the reporting out, we would just have to figure out how to report out safely and, and do it legally. Right. I, I think that the five bullets underneath belonging, safety and wellness all lend themselves to the absenteeism data. But just because as, a, as like a mental health person, you know, uh, it, you, you know, we're, this, we're trying to build structures to build resiliency in kids. And when you don't have the skills to manage your anxiety, you know, your feelings of isolation, you know, you don't have strong social skills, you get a stomach ache and you don't go to school. Um, or you have symptoms of you, your cold, you have a cold now, or I have a headache or, you know, it's, 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 that's, so that so I just want to put that out there. I think that I think the absenteeism is it's because it's also about like supporting families and giving families tools to support kids. And I think that's what Nick is Nick Connor is bringing to the district, which I think is should be everywhere. I don't know exactly whether or not there's a different way to say the goal, but I like that absenteeism is a is a reflection of kids not having social skills and coping skills to manage their emotions well. I, I think that they go hand in hand. That was that a new hat or an old hat? Old hat. Yeah. Old hat. I mean, I have a question of like, how do we want to think about our, our indicators and our goals? You know, the indicators, the way I kind of think about it is indicators are evergreen things that we always want to be working on as a district and we always want to be achieving these. And the goals are more like one to two year things that are informed, meant to be consistent and are, you know, that, that we should filter through the indicators, but are kind of like tangible things that we can do in a one to two year time frame that will start to, to lift the boat and and get us there so we're meeting these all the time and successfully um and yeah so how do we yeah you know, is that how we're thinking about them and if so how do we make it clear that the goals are informed by the indicators And and yeah, you know, the indi yeah, I mean, the indicators also kind of look to like goals too. So I mean, you know, some would do right goals without timelines. Yeah, deadlines. I mean, yeah. I was going to offer a suggestion, um, which is that we spend the next ten or fifteen minutes coming up with the ideas of what we would need in order to the next time around you know, make the progress you need to make and perhaps have these final. So for example, somebody could say, I would really like to see X in the goal, or I'll take a crack at trying to write a goal that does speak to these four different indicators, or I will take on the, you know, trying to um, articulate the goal or couple of goals under community engagement and accountability. 
um, since, you know, it's already 8.07 and it yeah. doesn't seem like it's, this is, you're going to finish it tonight, which like I said before is totally fine, but maybe we use the rest of the time we have allotted for this to figure out what is it that we need in order to get to the point where we think, yeah, these are, these, I'm, I'm good. Or I, you know, feel good about going to our community and saying, this is what we are going to achieve together in the next one to two years. Um, and I can take notes on that, and then we can. We haven't really, I may, we haven't really gone far into the community engagement piece, and I'm wondering if part of, if our goal should be to establish a baseline and then return to it in, in a year's time and and add a goal to that because we haven't done a great deal of measuring. We don't have a lot of data um, that I know of. Maybe I'm wrong, but I don't know how we measure that goal necessarily, and maybe. The goal is to sort of get a just to sort of broad survey. And I really like Jake's idea last board meeting when he was like randomly mail out a survey to the entire community, like mail out 300 surveys and see how many you get back to just random addresses and get, information. get a baseline from that or something like that. I don't know. So the goal would be to learn. To learn mm -hmm. where 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 we are with respect to our collective hopes about successfully communicating with the community, because I don't know where to go with that one. Yeah, stuff. yeah. <laughs> and make it district wide. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I feel you. <laughs> I wonder if she found her Crocs. <laughs> it, they were the sneakers. It, oh, she had the yeah. We were looking for what? the whole thing. <laughs> that explains it. So that's one idea. Story for another time. Okay. <laughs> what? I do. I I hope we don't lose the. I really like the. I guess we're calling the bullets are our indicators, right? We're not yeah. talking about replacing those. Correct. No. Because I think they're really good like value statements to hold ourselves to and that they're clear about what our objectives are. I, and so I'm I'm open to being flexible about particular goals for shorter term. Because I really don't want to lose these. I think these will be sort of evergreen. Um and but I appreciate the discussion because I think it's true. It's I don't want to shoehorn things, but we could start measuring something. I think you're right too, that we might just need to say, what's our baseline for the, can't measure something if we don't have a starting point. So for the community engagement piece. Yeah, I, I think we could do that and then yeah, and we could also have a simple concrete goal. I mean, we've talked about um, doing some regular outreach in the bridge, taking a, a half page. That could be another easy goal just that we know is going to increase community input. Um, I think we're going to do anyways. And in fairness, I think that's a really hard thing to measure regardless. It's super hard. Thinking about like industries that this is their whole focus is like, how do you measure engagement of your audience? And that's a really hard thing to capture. We can't get like clicks or viewership or something like that. That So we have to be forgiving about yeah. what, what we use there. So maybe it'll help. I was trying to capture what folks were saying as far as feedback goes on the goals. So let me say that all out loud and then you can let me know if I missed anything. And also if there's anything you wanted to add. Um, one is to include staff in the goal for belonging, safety and wellness, or maybe have a goal that is that um, addresses staff's feelings of belonging, safety and wellness. Um, another is to bring in language that will help us um, drive toward the true like closing of the academic gap. Um, perhaps that is including language that addresses identities and socioeconomic status to those, the goals that um, that we have, the draft goals that we have. 
um, incorporate rigor and ec excellence somehow in the goals. And then the counter feedback that we don't necessarily need to name it in order to be working on it. Um, and confirm or attempt to have the work, the, the, the language of the indicators reflected in the goals. Um, and then under, so that was just kind of general feedback. And then under, for the community engagement and accountability, um, that it seems like it's the, like kind of feeling on the board that this is a goal for the whole district, not just a board goal. And that maybe what we need to do right now is figure out where we are, like establish a baseline and have a goal that does that for us before we can set a goal for where we want to go. Did I miss any pieces of feedback that would help inform sharpening these goals? No, I think that's I think that's most of it. I mean, is is there a major goal someone feels isn't there that should be? Other than in community engagement, because uh, there yeah. aren't yet goals. Yeah. I mean, well, I'm assuming that Brett kind of filled that space for us, but at least temporarily. So here and now, so how are we going to get this work done? Are we going to come back to it next meeting and do it as a group? Does someone want to take a stab at a, a rewrite to give us a draft to work with? I think we need that. I think we operate at this stage. I think it's most helpful to operate in reaction to something that is in front of us rather than trying to, we have a lot in front of us yeah. too. Um, we can draw from the draft goals that we worked on a couple of meetings ago, in addition to the indicators and the all of the information that informed all of that. Um, how, about, how about this, why don't you and I work with Libby to come up with something we can present at the next meeting? Okay. Does that, does that work? With that, if Scott looks like he's ready to say something. Scott? No. Oh, you had your mouth open, yeah, sorry. I just smiled. Just breathing. Were, okay. you, were you about to volunteer to do it? Breathing. Did, did we speak too soon? I was trying. <laughs> Okay. And Jake's going to say Jake. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, to me, there's like the goals that involve, um, the administration. Um, and I'm okay with, with you guys working on that with Libby for the next meeting. Um, the community engagement piece, um, you know, that seems more like the statistical kind of setup. Um, and I am happy to work on that myself since I, you know, kind of have a, an idea of it. Um, and then the only like overarching feedback that I have um, is that um, I want the goals that we do land on um, to be like attainable and meaningful. So, um, you know, I, I, I was a teacher in a public school um, and I kind of know how these things filter down. So um, I don't want like pie in the sky type stuff. Um, like I want, you know, measurable, achievable. And if that means like that they're more modest or more incremental, that um, then that's okay. But I want, I want it to like really be something that we can get to. Yeah. Thanks, Jake. Excellent. Scott. I really appreciate that that perspective and I'm curious um Libby do you would you say that these as you you and your team have put together as they filter down would do you would you anticipate them feeling achievable to to Jake's um point we had a lot of conversation about whether the these particular percentages and either way you look at it, whether you're looking at pure percentage or growth, were achievable. And um this was these were the numbers that we came to consensus in. Um so I the administrative team believes they are achievable. Excellent. Um anything else on that? We've got a few more items and it's I just wanted to note that Jake did volunteer to do something. So yeah. it's you and me. 
working with Libby on overall on one and two. And then Jake's gonna is volunteering to take on. Awesome. Thank you, Jake. Drafting a goal for community engagement and accountability. No problem. I will I will do it. Thank you. Thank you. Um so net zero committee potential action. Uh, I think we want to potentially approve the charge. Um, I know, Kristen, if you're in a spot to give a quick overview of where we're at and what we want to do, but this looks excellent, by the way. Thank you. Yeah, we. Um, I don't think we received, you know, other than just looks great, <laughs> um, you know, following our last meeting in terms of comments on what we put before folks last round. So no significant changes have been included. Um, I think we added in our request for applicants, just making sure folks uh, know the avenue of how to go about applying. Um, so that was added. But uh, other than that, there were no significant um, changes to uh, what we had before the board in our last meeting at the last facilities and energy committee meeting, we spent a lot of time really kind of discussing an action plan, you know, should these be approved kind of how we would go about distributing the request for applicants so we could get uh, the work underway. Um, so yeah, I don't really have much kind of substantive content to add in terms of, you know, changes to what what's before you tonight. Um, but I feel like we are ready to go in terms of the committee. Should this get approved, we've got a plan, uh, you know, on paper to to get the work underway. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Um, do you want us to approve it? Yes. Yes. Um, I just wanted to bring up one consideration. Um, it's a it's 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 quite a commitment, and so I'm wondering if there's. Um, for from the, for the ad ad hoc community committee members, um, and I just I had this thought of like partners, um, so that if one person like like the possibility that there's an identified substitute for like each person, like Miriam is into it, and she has a friend that's also into it, and Miriam's the primary person, but something goes wrong, she's got other things going wrong, and her identified partner steps forward. And it's almost like, I don't know if this is a good idea or a bad idea, it's just a, a way to sort of um, have have consistent engagement. And, and if there and if it turns out there's a bunch of people that are all about it, then totally my idea is not has no use. But if it if it if there's some um, slowness in the amount of um, people that express interest, I wonder if we could make a make an adjustment that it could be pairs so that people don't feel like, I don't know if I can make this commitment, but I could make this commitment if my friend could back me up if I, for some reason, couldn't couldn't participate as much as I would like to or something like that. I don't know if that's a good idea or a bad idea, but does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It does. It does. Yeah, I hear more people need to yeah. raise their hands. It it does make sense. And I think for most of the the composition that is embedded in the, the committee composition, there's a couple where there's only one or two, but for students, it says two to four, right? So I think what you're saying, Rhett, would be covered if four students all joined, but only two of them could make it to any one particular meeting, it, at least there would still be student voice. Emma's got her hand up. Sorry, Emma. Uh, Emma. Yeah, this is the, we did talk about this in committee and basically um, we referred back to the School Safety Police Relations Committee. And when you have a committee of this size, it's exactly what Scott said, where there's, there's backup built into just the sheer numbers of people that are on the committee. So there's gonna, if, if somebody has to be absent, there's gonna be plenty of other people present to do the work. Yeah, and, and you will get you will get some attrition. And sometimes with the attrition, yeah, you can refill the spots too. Yeah. I move to approve the committee charge for the net zero subcommittee of the board. Do you have a second? Second. 
Any Ad further? Hoc. Any further? Thank you. Ad hoc. Yes. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? Thank you again. Um, so this committee, this is great work. It'll be exciting to move this forward. Uh, committee assignments. I think this is where Jake gets to let us know which committee he may or may not want to be on. Um, can I just, can I hold this up just one second? I think we just approved the committee charge. Do we need an approval for the uh, request for applicants or no approval needed there? That just kind of has the board's nod, but we don't need an approval to go ahead with that. I was assuming that the request for applicants was part of this whole process, but we can have a separate. It is, it is. It is. They're just two separate, you know, they're connected, but they're two separate doc documents. I just want to make sure that we've got the go ahead to go move forward with both well that's that's i, I think we're good but let's just take okay. 30 seconds and approve it i think the link goes back to the draft unless there are other people seeing something different yeah the i don't link. think we need to approve the form or the yeah i don't think we do either the request for applicants we don't need to approve i am I, that's i'm like 99 percent sure we great do. okay Excellent. Thank you. At least that's how I was reading it. I don't know. All right. Um, so committee assignments. Seiji was on equity and facilities. Uh, I know that facilities especially has expressed interest in having more members than it, it needs or more members than it has, sorry. It needs more members than it has, is what I meant to say. Um, I can't get access to you. You can go, you can open it from your email or from the board packet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I don't know why that link is yeah. broken, but I was just able to open okay. it from the Thank you. packet. Um, we also, you know, people can do a little, little shuffle too, if we want to. Uh, I know Jake, uh, do the, I mean, the, we could just swap you into where Seiji was, if that doesn't make sense for you, or if other people want to shift, we can talk about that. Um, so I'll, I'll just, I'll just open it up. I know Jake, if you want to express your preference first, or if you want to see if anybody's miserable on a committee or I in another committee, um, but or, we, feeling, or feeling stretched or feeling stretched, um, Um, well, I am interested in the facilities committee and you mentioned that they might be looking for another person. Um, and then finance, I don't know if they are looking for another person, but I might be able to help there. Um, so that would be two, um, you know, if somebody's super miserable somewhere, um, I'm interested in, you know, trying to make them I'm less. I'm really going to say something now. Yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, I think two is a good place to start. Okay. Uh, yes. And it might also be a good place to finish. Uh, I think it would be a lost opportunity to not have Jake on our finance committee. That's kind of my thought too. Is there anyone on finance who is interested in equities? The other, how many people do we have on equity? Three. Three now? Yeah. So we don't necessarily have to put someone on equity. How many people do we have on finance? Three. 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 Is there anyone on finance who is on three committees and wants to be on two? Is it? I'm happy to <laughs> secede. Yeah, Jill, in addition to being our um, person yeah. on CVCC, yeah. is also on negotiations. Yeah. Um, why don't we, why don't, if, if it makes sense, why don't we, uh, excuse Jill from a formal role on the finance committee. If she wants to visit, she can visit. Uh, and appoint Jake to the finance committee and the facilities committee. Um, does that make sense to everyone, especially Jake? Emma? I just wanted to clarify because I did not realize, I don't know if Lynn is in the room, but um, I did not realize that Lynn was on the facilities and energy committee and she has not been attending. So I'm not sure if she wants to just be removed from that, like officially. 
she's not here tonight. Yeah, she, she's so. not here. We can, Emma. yeah, we can, we can have that discussion uh, with her. Um, but let's let's that's a point, Jake, because I think we you know, there's a that's a he's interested. That's a good role for him, and um, yeah, and if and if Lynn has not been able to to go much, uh, that's a busy committee. So we want I think three dependable dependable folks. Um, but let's let's check with her before we, um, yeah, uh, excuse her of of those duties. So I'll just make. This motion as a package. I yep. move to appoint Jake to the Facilities and Energy Committee and the Finance Committee each, yep. and to relieve Jill of her appointment on the Finance Committee. Yes. Second. Do you want to? Uh, do you want to maybe reword it to say accept uh, Jill's? Offer to oh. step down so it doesn't sound like we're we're like firing her. Oh, right. <laughs> accept Jill's request to step step down from the finance committee. Uh, do I have a second? Any discussion? All those in favor? Uh, aye. 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 Great. Uh, right. Thank this you. Isn't, this isn't the House of Representatives. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> So really quickly, yeah. um, it's 828, and I don't know that now is a great time to have the conversation, but I, the idea of um, another committee around, I think Sagey orig originally mentioned it as, as, as a communication committee. I like more the idea of a, a community engagement yeah. committee, I just so that the engagement piece becomes a shared responsibility of the board. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know when that conversation can be had, but I think it's an important one to have. No, I think so too. I, my, my thought is to have it a little later. I am getting like 8.45. No, not 8.45. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Uh, my sense is that, that people are pretty maxed out on committee work and that there's not a lot of committee work that we can cut back on. So adding more committee work, I think is, is a stressor at this point. Um, and I think that's part of a bigger conversation. I think if we're going to have that committee, which I think is important, I think we also have to have a thoughtful conversation about how we relieve other stressors to make room for that. I also think it would be good to have that conversation after we've set the goal, yeah. because then we'll know that'll be a little bit more context for what the committee would do and can give us more direction. So be part that could be part of the conversation. Yeah. Are there committees that could, is there the possibility that it could be, um, either fold it into one committee or have a specific agenda point for every committee on every agenda or something like yeah. that? Is that mm. satisfied a need or something like that? Mm. I, I think we could do that. That's an interesting idea. Yeah. I mean, I, I, th I think there's a way we can get it done. Um, and I think we need to make room for that conversation at, at a different meeting. <laughs> uh, um policy monitoring reports we have uh three policy monitoring reports up for approval a22 notice of non-discrimination uh b2 uh volunteers and work study students and c7 student attendance uh do i have a motion to approve those monitoring reports I move we approve policy monitoring reports A22, B2, and C7. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any Aye. opposed? Nay. Uh, policy monitoring reports pass. Um, and surprisingly, almost right on time. Uh, a motion to adjourn. No, everyone wants to stay here. <laughs> nope.
Okay. I was just waiting for it to be 832. Yeah. And then I was going to do it. But okay. Still did it. I second. I right. second that motion. It's 832 now. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.